Welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha, a podcast shared by David Roylance. This podcast is dedicated to guiding you to completely eliminate the discontent mind and the suffering it causes by attaining enlightenment. Learn and practice the teachings of Gotama Buddha that will guide you to fully attain a peaceful, calm, serene, and content mind with joy. To support this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha or visit buddhadailywisdom.com where you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online learning resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Now, here's our teacher to share more. Sawadee Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our group learning program and we're in chapter 22 of this book titled Developing a Life Practice, The Path That Leads to Enlightenment. This chapter is titled Mental Health, A Modern Day Delusion. This is where you start understanding how what we've been maybe taught in terms of mental health and how pharmaceuticals are used in order to get the mind to no longer be sad or frustrated or having anxiety or stress or other certain things that are today labeled as mental illnesses can actually be remedied through learning and training the mind through practicing the teachings of the Buddha. The anguish and the symptoms that one experiences when they're diagnosed with mental illnesses is 100% accurate and people are really struggling with certain challenges and difficulties in the world. But the cause of what's happening and why the mind is experiencing these things is not necessarily accurate. And what I'm going to be doing today is sharing with you teachings that can help you to see how things like bipolar disorder, depression, stress, anxiety, ADHD, ADD, anorexia, bulimia, PTSD, suicidal thoughts, and a lot of other mental health challenges can all be remedied through learning, reflecting, and practicing these teachings to train the mind. I'm going to be helping you to understand the three universal truths and four noble truths just as a little bit of a refresher because I'm never sure 100% of who's actually learning with me at any particular time. Of course, there's plenty of students who've been learning with me and understand the three universal truths and four noble truths. But in order to explain to you the teachings that I have about mental health, it's important that anybody who's tuning in understands the three universal truths and four noble truths. So I'm going to do a brief little recap and refresh on that. And that's going to help even those of you that have learned this before so that then we can move into talking about mental health and we're going to be discussing various aspects of the mental health field, what you may be encountering yourself or people around you may be encountering. So that way you have the wisdom to be able to improve upon the symptoms that you're experiencing or maybe your loved ones are experiencing. That way you can get liberated from the constant challenges that are being experienced by the discontent feelings. So I'd like to welcome all of you to our class today, whether you're joining for the first time or you're joining regularly, I would like to let you know that you're going to be able to ask questions as we go in our class today. All you need to do is put those into the comment section of Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom. Or if you're in Zoom, you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions or follow up questions directly. So to understand the Four Noble Truths, it's important to first understand the three universal truths. And this is something that I teach at the very beginning of this group learning program. And we revisit it multiple times throughout the group learning program because it's utterly important that one establishes right view and they see the truth in the three universal truths and the four noble truths. That is what's going to help you ultimately prepare the mind in establishing right view to then apply all the other teachings and tools and techniques that the Buddha shares in order to eliminate discontentedness and get to this enlightened mental state where the mind is peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy, no longer experiencing even the slightest displeasure or discontentedness. The mind can get to a point where it's focused, concentrated, having clarity of mind and deep memory. You can get to the point where you're 
personal and professional relationships are blossoming. You're never even in a bad mood by the time the mind gets to enlightenment. You're always in a good mood because you've uprooted the conditions that are causing the bad mood. And as you're learning, it's important that you don't believe any of the teachings of the Buddha, but instead that you learn them, you reflect on them to independently verify them, and you practice them. And this is where the real transformation is occurring, that as one is accumulating wisdom through not believing the teachings, but seeing the truth for yourself, you're able to apply the teachings in practice and see the real transformation to the condition of the mind. So we did the same thing with the natural law of gravity as we were growing up. We lacked wisdom of that natural law, so we made unwise decisions that led to unwholesome results. But slowly but surely, we awakened to the wisdom of the natural law of gravity, and then we made wiser decisions that led to wholesome results. And the same thing is happening with the natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught, is that the mind is struggling and having difficulties, just like it did when we didn't understand understand the wisdom of the natural law of gravity. Back then we fell down, we hit our elbow, we hit our knees, we had all kinds of difficulties. But now we're at the point where we can climb ladders, we can ride bicycles, we can ride motorcycles, we can fly on airplanes all over the world because we've awakened to this wisdom of the natural law of gravity and now we make wiser decisions that produce wholesome outcomes. So the teachings of the Buddha are the same way, is that he's explaining the natural laws of existence to you so that you can independently verify them. And then with that wisdom, you will make wiser decisions that lead to wholesome results instead of unwise decisions that lead to unwholesome results. So as I teach you here, I'm going to be helping you learn, reflect, and then share with you how to practice as well. And then we'll move into talking about mental health and this is a foundational teaching, the three universal truths and four noble truths in order to help you understand what I'm gonna share with you about mental health. It's important to understand that we call these truths, the three universal truths and four noble truths, because the Buddha knew that they were truth. I know that they're truth and others know that they're true. But in order for you to get the benefit, you need to know that they're truth. And that's how you'll actually help to awaken the mind by gaining the wisdom. So this universal truth of impermanence is helping you to see that everything is constantly changing. All these material objects in the world are constantly changing. They're not steady or fixed. So material objects, possessions, relationships, thoughts, ideas, states of mind, all these things are constantly changing. They're what's called conditioned feelings or conditioned objects. So these conditioned objects will arise, they will change, and then they will fade away. This is impermanence, the universal truth of impermanence, a conditioned object. There's also things that are called unconditioned objects. This is enlightenment itself and the natural laws of existence. These are not going to change. Once you attain the mental state of enlightenment, the mind is unconditioned. So you don't experience the arising of temporary feelings that then fade away. Instead, the mind is permanently peaceful, calm, serene, and content with joy. And the natural laws of existence that the Buddha taught that you need to awaken to in order to experience this enlightened mental state are the same natural laws that existed during his lifetime as they exist now. That's why his teachings are timeless. The books and people's memories and what people are discussing as the teachings of the Buddha, those things have changed over time because they're conditioned objects. But the natural laws themselves have not changed and is why his teachings are timeless that once you discover these teachings and you learn reflect and practice you can awaken and see the truth for yourself but all conditioned objects they're going to arise change and fade away and you can see this to be true if you investigate your own physical body your relationships your bank account your job the weather outside, the sidewalk, you can see that all these things are constantly changing. The sidewalk has cracks in it, your body starts to change, you get wrinkles, gray hair, you lose your hair, you might get a pimple or a mole, your bank account goes up and down, people come in and out of your life, this is all impermanence. So you'll need to see and verify this for yourself so that you know that without a shadow of a doubt that all these things around you are impermanent. You need to see that very clearly. The second universal truth is discontentedness. Some people refer to this as suffering. If you've been learning the teachings of the Buddha in other places, you might see them use the word suffering. I don't use this word because it doesn't accurately represent what the Buddha was describing in the original source text 
using the word dukkha. This is the word in the Pali Canon, the original source text. People are translating that to suffering in some cases, but I use the word discontent, discontented, and discontentedness, and I'll explain why in a moment. But let me first explain what discontentedness is. This universal truth of discontentedness is explaining the unenlightened mind, that it experiences pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. Pleasant feelings are things like happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, exhilaration, euphoria. These are very pleasant for the mind to experience, and they are conditioned feelings. They're based on some condition. So if it's sunny outside, you might be happy. Or if you get a raise at work, you might be excited. Or if your mom is coming to visit you and she hasn't come to see you for a long time, you might get elated or thrilled. There's some condition that the mind is basing its inner feelings so it gets these pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, and others. But then it's only a matter of time that that condition changes and now the mind experiences painful feelings like sadness, anger, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, stress, anxiety, and other painful feelings. Because if one bases their inner feelings on some condition, that condition is impermanent. So if you base your inner feelings of happiness on a condition, when that condition changes due to impermanence, your feeling is going to change too. So it's impossible for you to experience permanent happiness as long as you're basing your happiness on some condition because that condition is impermanent. And then there's neither painful nor pleasant feelings. I put boredom and loneliness in here, but some people tell me that's quite painful for them. So you could put that in the painful category. But shyness is a good example of this. Or perhaps if you were sitting next to somebody on public transportation that you didn't know and your body was touching their body, you would probably say that it's neither painful nor pleasant, that the mind is kind of dissatisfied or uncomfortable. And these are the three feelings that the unenlightened mind is going to experience. And you can verify this for yourself through your own direct experience. You can look over the course of your life and see that you've experienced these different feelings. And this is your mind going up and down and up and down. At different times, you're going to have some peacefulness or calmness here and there. But it's only a matter of time before some conditioned feeling comes in. And the mind is shaken up and unsteady in those situations. And therefore, it's very challenging to make wise decisions when your mind is shaken up. So you'll tend to make unwise decisions when your mind is experiencing discontentedness. So some people refer to this as suffering. But I use this word discontentedness because it fully explains what the Buddha was describing. Because when you're experiencing pleasant feelings, you probably wouldn't say you were suffering. Or when you're experiencing shyness or that person that you don't know sitting on public transportation next to you, you probably wouldn't say you were suffering in that situation. So suffering only explains painful feelings, which is essentially 33% of what the Buddha was talking about here in this universal truth. So one is missing 66% of the understanding of what the Buddha was teaching. And if you're missing that much understanding, it will be very difficult for you to experience the results of enlightenment as long as you're not understanding. So a enlightened being is going to be experiencing unconditioned mental qualities where an unenlightened being might wake up in the morning, see that it's sunny outside and get so excited. Yes, I'm going to go hiking today. Outstanding. I'm going to go do some activity outside. You go take a shower and you come out and you're like, ah, it's raining. Why is it raining? And now you might be sad or frustrated because you based your excitement on the condition of the sun. And because the sun is impermanent, the unenlightened mind is then going to experience painful feelings when that condition changes. Where an enlightened mind, if they wake up, they're already having unconditioned happiness or joy. Their mind is beyond the pleasure and pain. Their mind is already happy or experiencing joy before they ever awake. And then when they awake and they notice it's sunny outside, it's like, sweet, all right, I'm going to go hiking. I'm going to go do activities outside. You might go take a shower and then you come out. And if the mind is enlightened and you see that it's raining, it's like, all right, well, it's raining. So what else can I do? I can go read a book. I can stay home and cook some food. I can go see some friends. I can go to the mall. There's other things that you could potentially do besides clinging and holding on to the weather and expecting it to be permanent when in fact it is impermanent. 
So here, the word discontent, discontented, and discontentedness is explaining that unsteady, uncalm, that shaken up mind that one experiences when there's a conditioned feeling of either pleasant, painful, or neither painful nor pleasant. Then there's the universal truth of non-self. This is where one is understanding that there is no permanent self, which is the remedy for the very first fetter or pollution or taint or defilement that the Buddha describes as personal existence view. Where this pollution of personal existence view in the unenlightened mind, the mind is holding on to this body or this mind thinking that this is who you are. There's this misperception or this misunderstanding or this confusion in the unenlightened mind that it thinks that this self-image or the self-identity in the mind is who you are. And now if you have agreeable contact related to the self-image or self-identity, there will be pleasant feelings. But if there's disagreeable contact related to the self-image or self-identity, you will experience painful feelings. So as long as the mind falsely believes or has the mistaken understanding that this body or mind is you, then you will experience discontentedness related to the self-image and self-identity. So if you spill some spaghetti sauce or pizza sauce or chocolate ice cream on your clothing, you might feel embarrassed because you think that this self-image represents who you are. Or if you see a wrinkle or a gray hair or a pimple or something like this, you might feel discontent. But if you understand that this body is not you and that it's impermanent and that it's constantly changing, you can move beyond that. Or if you have a certain self-identity in the mind, like I am American or I am a Brit or I am an Aussie or I am Italian or I am French or any of these other I am. Sometimes the mind is clinging to a certain identity, maybe about your job. You know, I am a police officer or I am a lawyer or I am a Buddhist teacher or I am a husband. I am a wife. I am a father. I am a mother. All this I am, I am, these certain roles that we perform in the world, the mind adopts that as our identity. And then as things change over time, if we retire from our occupation or our occupation changes, or maybe our kids leave home, or we break up in a relationship, the mind struggles because it feels like this is part of its identity. And now the mind wants to maybe hurry up and get back into another relationship. Or you feel like you don't know who you are anymore. If you've had a certain job and you've ended that job, you might feel lost without this particular job. So you can get to a point where you understand the universal truth of non-self or you've realized non-self and now because of that you understand that this body nor this mind is you and now you can reside peaceful and joyful as it relates to having eliminated personal existence view that you understand that this isn't who you are and that there's going to be changes to the self-image and the self-identity so let me see if you guys have any questions on the three universal truths you can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, and I'll be able to see those. Let's see, it looks like Eugene has a question. Go ahead, Eugene. Hello, David. Um, I have a question to the last sentence of the rule uh, impermanence. Um, they're, say, they're saying that the fixed state is enlightenment, but like if, if, I, if I take a look on it uh, compared to the other points, I would say yes, of course, it's a fixed state, but isn't the enlightenment self as well kind of evolving after you are kind of reaching this state? So or, what? Oh, sorry, go ahead. You, you see what I mean? Yes. So in the unenlightened state, there's conditions that are in the mind that are causing it to be shaken up. And now, because of those conditions in the mind, it experiences conditioned feelings, that they arise, they change, and they fade away. But by the time you get to enlightenment, you now have unconditioned the mind, meaning that there are no conditions that are gonna cause conditioned feelings. You've purified the mind of the conditions. Those conditions are craving, anger, and ignorance. More detail, it's the 10 fetters. Those are the conditions that are causing the mind to experience conditioned feelings. But when you've trained your mind and purified it, those conditions no longer exist. So the mind is experiencing this steady, constant, fixed state of peace, calm, serenity, and contentedness with joy. 
once the mind is enlightened, you can experience increased levels of concentration. So once you get to enlightenment, you've eliminated discontentedness, but you can still cultivate wisdom about other things in the world. Like maybe you're interested in flying a helicopter or you know, doing any number of things that you might decide to do. So you'll still cultivate wisdom in the mind. You'll still notice increased levels of concentration as you are enlightened. And then the mind continues to evolve from there. But the enlightened mental state itself is steady, constant, and fixed. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Let me see if we have any questions anywhere else on our platforms. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions anywhere. So let's go ahead and continue forward with our review of the three universal truths and the four noble truths. As you guys see, I'm moving through this, you know, more than I would normally do. I'm kind of just working right through it so that just a refresher for those of you guys that have learned this before, but those of you guys that have never learned this with me, you can learn it and understand it. So here you need to understand craving, desire, attachment, or expectations, wants, holding, grasping, clinging. This is the mental longing for something with a strong eagerness, the mind pulling in the direction of the objects of its affection. Some people say it feels like they're being pushed. Essentially, it's like the mind chasing after the objects of its affection, thinking that the next new shiny object around the corner is going to provide some lasting satisfaction. So the mind longs and yearns for this, chasing and chasing and chasing. If you've ever been in the mall and you saw a brand new pair of shoes or a phone or a computer or a video game or a certain article of clothing, and you're just like, oh, I got to have that. Oh, and you know, you just kind of like almost long and yearn and lurch for it. This is what craving desire attachment is. It's not the object itself. It's not the shoes. It's not the phone or the computer. It's the mental longing inside the mind, the way the mind is relating to this object. The mind thinks that this object is going to provide some kind of lasting satisfaction. So it longs and yearns for it. So it's not the object itself because you're going to need to have shoes and clothes and certain technology around you, perhaps. So those things are just possessions. They're material objects. But as long as the mind is longing and yearning for these things, that's what the craving, desire, attachment or the expectations or wants are holding. Also, like if you are in a particular environment, like say at your house and it's quite quiet, and now when you hear some noise, if the mind's longing and yearning for quietness, now it hears the noise, right? Or maybe the opposite. Maybe you're in noise and now you're longing and yearning for peacefulness. Your mind is thinking that if I just get this quietness, everything will be perfect in my life. So now when the mind hears that noise, that's where it really struggles. And that's what the Four Noble Truths are going to explain to you. So you'll need to understand craving, desire, attachment as a mental longing. And this is also referred to as expectations or wants, holding, grasping, clinging, the mind chasing after the objects of its affection. So then you can start to understand the Four Noble Truths now with this background. The Four Noble Truths is explaining the problem in the unenlightened mind, the cause, the elimination, and the path forward. This is where you can have a breakthrough to establishing right view. And if you can establish right view, understanding the problem, the cause, the elimination, and the path forward, now you can do the real work to actually eliminate the discontent feelings. If you didn't understand what the problem, the cause, the elimination, and the path forward to eliminating these discontent feelings, you wouldn't actually be able to accomplish the real work. So that's why this is the first step on the path to enlightenment is to establish right view. And you can independently see this for yourself, that the first noble truth is everyone that is unenlightened will experience discontentedness, those conditioned feelings, the conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. So in the unenlightened state, the mind can only experience happiness if this condition is met, this condition is met, this condition is met, then I will be happy. And then the problem with that is those conditions are impermanent. So now when those conditions don't exist anymore, the mind will move to the painful feelings. So this is the problem that the unenlightened mind is experiencing, which is conditioned feelings, discontentedness. The mind is basing its inner feelings on some condition and that condition is impermanent. So as long as the mind continues to do that, it will continue to struggle and have difficulties. 
Then the second noble truth is explaining that discontentedness is caused by our own cravings, desires, attachments, because the mind wants everything to be permanent when everything in the world is impermanent. So I'll say this a few times and give you some examples. Those conditioned feelings of pleasant, painful, neither painful nor pleasant discontentedness is caused by the mind's craving, desire, attachments, the longing, the yearning, the chasing after the objects of your affection, the wanting of things to be permanent when everything around you is impermanent because the unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence and it's craving permanence. So one of the ways to say this is, yes, the mind is craving permanence, but another way to say it is the mind does not like impermanence. The unenlightened mind does not like change. It doesn't like when things are constantly changing, but yet it lives in this world of constant change. So as long as the mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence, that it is in this world of constant change, and it hasn't been trained to understand impermanence, then it's going to keep craving permanence and it's going to keep getting shaken up in certain situations where it's having craving desire attachment. So if you've been in a relationship and when you guys first got together, you might have gotten pleasant feelings based on the condition of getting affection or someone's going out with you to the movies or to dinner. There might be intimate contact. They might be calling to check in on you. And these are producing pleasant feelings in the mind based on the condition of having a partner, for example. But now as time goes on and the expectations grow in this relationship, you become discontent and or they become discontent and the relationship ends. And now the mind experiences the painful feelings of sadness, anger, frustration, or others because the mind is craving for this relationship to be permanent when it was always impermanent. And this is the same thing that's happening if you get a brand new object like a car and there's a scratch on it. You might get frustrated because the mind's craving for this car to be permanent when in fact it's always been impermanent. Or if you experience where you're in the house, like I said, and things are pretty quiet and then you hear this loud noise, you might get irritated or you might get afraid or you might have other feelings that arise. Or you might have a craving for everyone to talk to you, polite, kind, friendly, and respectful. And now when somebody's impolite, unkind, unfriendly, and disrespectful, you might get irritated or frustrated or agitated. If the mind's craving any particular thing or object, then it's going to experience those conditioned pleasant feelings when it gets what it wants. Then when it doesn't get what it wants, it's going to get those painful feelings. And then there's these neither painful nor pleasant feelings as well. You can independently verify this by looking at a recent time when you've been frustrated, irritated, angry, or some other discontent feeling and see how your mind is causing it itself. That's essentially what the second noble truth is explaining to you is that your mind is causing these feelings yourself. The craving desire attachment is what's causing it. But when the mind doesn't have right view, it has wrong view, meaning that it will typically blame other people or it will blame the situation or the circumstances. And you think that that's what's causing your mind to be irritated or angry or some other discontent feeling. And when the mind has wrong view and it falsely believes that this external thing is what's causing your mind to be discontent, you will typically push that person away or push the situation away. This is called aversion. Or you will be bitter and harsh and aggressive towards that individual, feeling almost justified in your anger and frustration because you think they're the ones who are causing it. Or you will put your expectations on somebody, thinking if you can just get them to do what you want, everything will be perfect because you get your cravings fulfilled. So by putting your expectations on people, then you feel like you're going to get what you want, the objects of your affection, and that solves everything. But in reality, none of this actually solves the problem. Pushing people away doesn't solve the problem. That's why you get angry about something else or you get irritated about something else. No matter who you push out of your life or what situations you push out of your life, you're still going to get angry and frustrated and irritated. Or if you become bitter and harsh and aggressive towards people, that doesn't solve the problem either. They will oftentimes leave out of your life because of that. Or putting your expectations on people, even if you can coerce them into doing things your way, they oftentimes feel pressured and they might leave out of your life because of that. So as long as you have these expectations that are continuing to grow, 
these conditions, these cravings, these wants, these desires that continue to grow, the number of people that you can spend time with in your life becomes smaller and smaller and smaller. It becomes fewer and fewer. That there's less people that you can spend time with because your expectations grow. And even when you meet somebody new, It's only a matter of time before they do something that you disagree with and now you push them away, become bitter and harsh or put your expectations on them. So the mind really struggles in daily life and having difficulties because it keeps going up and down and up and down and it finds it challenging to live harmoniously in all relationships because it has certain expectations and wants. It has these cravings, desires, attachments. So the way you get liberated from this is to be able to see the truth that yes, this is indeed the truth, that your mind is indeed causing its own discontentedness. And you can see that through reflection. And if you can't see that, let me know and I will help you to see it. And then as you understand the cause is craving desire attachment, then you move on to the third noble truth, understanding to eliminate this problem of discontentedness that you need to eliminate cravings, desires, attachments, the mental longing, strong eagerness. And the Buddha prescribes things like breathing mindfulness meditation to train the mind to let go and be able to easily do that. So in breathing mindfulness meditation, we're training our mind to cultivate mindfulness or awareness of mind so that you can observe when the mind is craving, when it is longing, you can notice that that you cultivate concentration, being able to focus on a single object like the breath, because now you can see your mind more clearly. And then when the mind moves off the breath in meditation, you're cutting that off and bringing the mind back. The goal in breathing mindfulness meditation isn't to eliminate the thoughts, but 20, 30, 50 times in your meditation, you're training the mind to let go, let go, let go. Because when there's craving, desire, attachment in the mind, the mind tends to hold on very tightly. And then when you're exercising the mind two or three times a day, building up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more, you'll find that that level of exercise of the mind on a consistent ongoing basis now in daily life you'll be able to more easily let things go where before your mind held on to things and then your feelings started to become very discontent with anger frustration and others and then you also use generosity where you're giving and you're sharing with people around you you understand this interconnectivity that you're sharing your time effort energy and resources this helps you to train the mind to let go Because with a mind of craving, desire, attachment, there tends to be a lot of selfishness in the mind and the mind's holding on very tightly. So you need to find that middle way with your generosity where you're not sharing excessively and you don't have the basic necessities that you and your family need to sustain your life, but you're also not indifferent about this and never sharing and being selfish either, that you find this middle way where you're able to share your time, effort, energy, and resources. And this is part of the training that helps you to eliminate craving, desire, attachment. But it's the fourth noble truth that fully explains the complete solution, which is practicing the Eightfold Path. When you practice the Eightfold Path, there's eight individual steps that you're dialing in closer and closer to train the mind to be able to now practice this life practice that is ultimately training the mind based on wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline. And as you're training your mind with these eight steps, starting with right view, you can see clearly that your mind is causing its own discontentedness, and that's why you can actually solve it by training the mind through these eight steps. Oftentimes we're taught in life that the goal is to be happy and that we should be happy. Well, if you're creating your inner feelings based on some impermanent condition, like maybe you've been taught to chase after money or cars or a bigger house or a certain relationship or certain title at work. If you're chasing, 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 chasing these things, basing your inner feelings on whether you attain them or not then you're ultimately going to end up in unhappiness. So sitting around doing nothing and being complacent isn't going to promote a healthy mind. The mind's going to be dull and lethargic. But also chasing after things, the mind can only be happy when it gets what it wants. So you're going to need to find this middle way where you're pursuing things as a goal, objective, or interest, where the mind can be content, free of craving, desire, attachment, and satisfied with what is. This is just one aspect of enlightenment. And once you attain this enlightened mental state, it's a permanent mental state. The Eightfold Path is 
organized into eight individual steps. And what an individual would need to do is learn with the words of the Buddha what each individual step is. And this is what we do in this program. I start out the program that way, diving into detail. And then I cover it again in chapter five, where we go in and talk about this in detail using the words of the Buddha. And it's kind of like a sound system. If you had speakers and you had eight dials and you're trying to dial in the sound system to get a really beautiful sound coming out of the speakers, you're doing the same thing with the human mind as you're dialing in these eight steps closer and closer in your life, realizing that that's gonna take time for you to develop your understanding of this eightfold path and then implement it in your life more and more closely. But as you tweak these eight dials with wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline, you see the condition of the mind gradually improving, moving to concentration and clarity, focus, deep memory. You'll see your personal professional relationships blossom. You'll have the wisdom to no longer be bitter and harsh and hostile in your relationships. That's why the Buddha includes moral conduct here, because as long as you're putting out hostility and aggression, and other types of things like bitterness and things like this, that's all going to come back to you. So by purifying your moral conduct based on wisdom and then training in the mental discipline, now you can fine tune your mind and get it to the point where you're not experiencing the sadness, the anxiety, the stress, and all these other discontent feelings. So let me pause here before we move into talking about mental health specifically and see what questions you guys might have related to this so that I can be sure that you all have a baseline foundational understanding of the Four Noble Truths and the Three Universal Truths. So it looks like we have a question here from Max coming in on Zoom. So when there is something we are considering buying, we need to be aware of the mind to make sure it's not a craving. Also being aware after the purchase to make sure excited feelings don't arise maybe delaying a purchase to ensure there isn't a craving to run out and purchase something. Exactly, Max. That's the ideal thing because most things in our life that we need to purchase, whether we purchase it today or we purchase it a few days or a few weeks from now, it doesn't really matter. So say you're interested in getting a new phone. You might go visit a couple places that have a new phone and then step away from it. Like you're just shopping, you're just observing what are the prices, what are the models, what are the uniquenesses. And while you're doing this, while you're shopping, you're observing the mind, the condition of the mind through mindfulness. Is it longing, yearning? Is it lurching forward? Is it really wanting that phone? When you step away from the shopping and you go home, is the mind agitated? Is it sad? Is it frustrated or irritated that you didn't buy the phone? So when you observe the mind this way during the shopping experience and afterwards when you've stepped away, whether it's a phone or clothes or anything else, then you can notice whether there's any discontentedness there. Because if there's discontentedness, there is a craving desire attachment. So you might need to actually do that a few times where you go shopping, you check in on things and you step away. And then if you're convinced that there isn't a craving desire attachment after doing this several times, then you might make this major purchase. If it's something simple or small, you know, like deodorant or soap or something like this, you know, you just need these things. So you're probably not attached to them. But if you go and there's a certain brand that you normally purchase and that's not stocked, and then you get frustrated or irritated, then you see that you're attached to that particular soap or that particular shampoo. You should be comfortable with just purchasing another thing or maybe going to another store that has it. You shouldn't feel irritation or annoyance arising during those situations. And by observing your mind, you'll be able to see the truth of whether there's a craving. And then after you make a purchase of something like a phone or a car or anything else, you need to observe the mind there too, that if you're having any discontentedness related to this object, then you know there's craving there and you'll need to eliminate that through the generalized training of breathing mindfulness, meditation, and generosity. But then oftentimes you need to put the mind in the situation where it's discontent. And I've given examples of this in the past where when I was first starting to really deeply practice these teachings, I left my home one time accidentally leaving my phone at home and some fear came up in the mind. And right away, the mind wanted to go back home and get the phone and thinking that that was going to solve the problem because the mind had a craving for this phone to be permanent. But when I understood that that's not going to solve the problem, the real problem is the craving. The problem wasn't that I didn't have the phone. 
the problem was that the mind wanted the phone to be permanent. So even though I was planning to go out for just an hour and a half that day, I extended my trip outside. I stayed out for a longer period of time without the phone to train the mind that it can be peaceful and joyful without a phone. And then over subsequent weeks, I purposely left the phone at home on multiple occasions to train the mind to go out without it. And then about two months after that training multiple times, I accidentally left my phone at home again and I noticed that I didn't have it with me and there was no fear whatsoever. So I knew that the mind was liberated from that particular attachment. And you would like to repeat this same process with various cravings, desires, attachments that you see and that's how you ultimately get to liberation for all your individual cravings, desires, attachments. But you need to have that baseline breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity ongoing so that it becomes easier and easier for you to let go of your attachments and identify them when they're there. I see you raised your hand. If you have a follow-up question or some clarification, feel free to go ahead. Yes, sir. Uh, so what, uh, I guess, can you speak on maybe purchasing something that is not a necessity, but something that we might want to purchase that we feel I guess we, something that we might get uh, a bit of enjoyment out of, but still. Good um, morning. Sh- sorry. Good morning. Okay. Hi, it's quiet time. Hold on a second. <laughs> um, but uh, purchasing something we might um, get some enjoyment out of, but still understanding that it's impermanent and um, um, that, you know, it. Uh, that the item won't last for forever, we can't cling to it or whatnot. Yeah, it's the same kind of thing that if you go to this item, like let's just say a big screen TV, right? If somebody would like to purchase a big screen TV, you might go shopping to a couple different places. And while you're looking at the product, you can be telling your mind that this is impermanent. Okay, I'm considering purchasing this. I may or may not get it. They may not have it in stock. Even when I do get it, it's going to sometimes not work. You know, you use your remote control. It sometimes doesn't work. Sometimes you turn on your TV or it shuts down or sometimes the electric isn't working. So you'll see that there's impermanence with something even like a TV. So you just need to teach yourself. And sometimes you're talking to yourself internally as you're looking at this product to understand that it's impermanent. And you can go to places, you can look at it, and you can step away. And oftentimes when there's craving, the mind wants to hurry up and purchase this. It's trying to hurry up and get those pleasant feelings. It's almost like a an addiction or a drug that it's longing and yearning and thinking that if I just get this TV, everything will be perfect in my life. So that's where you can go see things and you can step away. And you can observe your mind through the shopping experience and afterwards when you step away. And you might need to do this several times before you actually make the purchase. But you're actually helping yourself because you're getting ahead of the curve. Because if you have craving and you purchase the item and now you bring it home, now you've got another craving and you're sitting there at home with this craving and it's going to be much more challenging for you to now get rid of it if you allow the craving to form. So if you can get ahead of the curve before you ever purchase it and make sure that you don't crave it before you purchase it, then by the time you do purchase it, then you're bringing home something that you know that you need and that you're going to, yes, enjoy, and that maybe your family is going to enjoy it too, but this is something that you know that you don't have a craving towards. So now if the TV breaks or the electric's off or the remote control's not working or there's some kind of software glitch somewhere, you're not going to be frustrated at this situation because there's no craving there. Okay, let's see. We have some other things coming in on YouTube here someone says I collect Buddhist statues how to overcome this so what's important for you to understand with Buddhist statues is if you are attached to them then the mind's going to be discontent right so if you continue to think that these Buddhist statues are going to produce some kind of lasting satisfaction for you there's going to be discontentedness so understand that the Buddha didn't teach people to make statues of him There's no way that a statue is going to produce any beneficial results in the mind. If the mind's longing and yearning and thinking that these things are going to produce lasting satisfaction, then the mind's just clinging and holding on to them. And now if they get stolen or broken as you you move them around or whatever, there's going to be discontentedness. So 
what you can do is restrain the mind. If you're using breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity, you're practicing breathing mindfulness meditation, and that's training your mind to let go of lots of different things. And then you can practice generosity. You can even practice generosity by giving away some of your Buddha statues. You might still decide to have some statues of the Buddha around because some people use these as a reminder to meditate or a reminder to use things like right speech and things like this. But as long as your mind is clinging to these and you can observe whether your mind's holding on, whether it's longing and yearning, there's going to be discontentedness. So one of the ways to do that is to let them go and give them away as gifts to people or give them to temples or things like this. And this can help you to let go. And then when you observe that your mind is longing, yearning and wanting to go purchase a new one, you've got to restrain the mind. You've got to pull it back. You've got to cut that off and let it go. And you'll be able to do that better if you've been practicing breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity. You'll be having more control of the mind to be able to accomplish that. But you can also practice generosity in other areas too, because, you know, I don't know about your collection, you know, how expensive they are and, you know, how significant they are. But if you have some smaller ones that are less expensive and things like this, and you're able to easily give them away, that would be wise. If you're not interested in giving them away long term, you can even take them and maybe put some of them at another friend's house or a family member's house so that you don't see them for a while. You need to distance yourself from the statues. The Buddha teaches this about eliminating craving. He says to first distance yourself from the object. And once you distance yourself from the object, then you've got to remove the craving from the mind. It's a two-step process. So you can either give these statues away or you can put them somewhere else for safekeeping. Maybe you box them up in your own home or you give them to a family member to hold on to. And now you've distanced yourself from it. And now you go a period of months or years of not purchasing any new statues. But all the while you need to be using things like the meditation and generosity to train the mind to let go. And you need to be using that mental discipline section of the Eightfold Path, practicing mindfulness or awareness of mind, so that if you feel this sudden urge or sensation to go purchase one, that you then apply right effort to restrain the mind and pull it back and don't allow it to happen. All right, so excellent questions, guys. Let's go on because I'm not seeing any more questions here in our platforms. Let's move on to the next thing that I would like to share with you guys related to this topic of mental health. In reality, we've really been talking about mental health the whole time because when you're understanding the three universal truths and four noble truths, you're developing wisdom in the mind that's going to ultimately help you with your mental health. The first thing to discuss as it relates to mental health is to understand that the brain is not the mind and the mind is not the brain. These are two completely separate things. The brain is part of the physical body. There's physical structures associated with the brain. It's a tangible thing that you can actually touch. But the mind itself is not tangible. It's not physical in nature, and you can't physically touch the mind. In Western culture, we tend to point to the head when we're talking about the mind, and this is where the confusion comes along, that some people think that the brain and the mind are the same thing because we tend to point to the head. Here in Thailand, they point to the heart and they touch their heart when they're talking about the mind because they think of the mind as existing inside the heart. Other cultures like India and other places, they think that the mind is outside the body. So there's different cultures that consider the mind to be one place or the other. But in reality, it's not physical. So it's not existing in any one particular location. It's a non-tangible, non-physical thing that can't be touched. So it's important to understand as we get ready to talk about mental health and the way it's being approached in some places in the world, that the brain and the mind are two different things. The symptoms that people are experiencing of sadness, stress, anxiety, and others, those pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant, oftentimes as people are experiencing these, they're seeking chemicals to change the brain chemistry, thinking that if you change the brain chemistry, this will solve the feelings in the mind. But the chemicals are not a permanent solution. The brain chemistry isn't the cause of the problem. So tweaking brain chemistry isn't going to actually solve the problem. The actual problem that is being experienced in the mind is this craving desire attachment. And there isn't any chemical that you can apply into the body and into the brain because the craving desire attachment doesn't exist in the brain. 
the craving desire attachment is in the mind it's in this intangible non-physical thing that you can't touch there's a connection between the mind and the brain but they're two completely separate things so as long as we're over here tweaking brain chemistry trying to produce some kind of change in the mind then we're not looking at the real problem we're practicing wrong view so discontentedness can't be eliminated through changing brain chemistry there's certain experiences that we have as human beings, we might experience something called psychosis, if you've ever experienced that. And in those acute situations, there needs to be a certain amount of chemicals that are applied to the brain in order to bring the brain chemistry to a certain balance. And then one can start to learn and practice teachings to train the mind. So there's certainly a need for these chemicals and this pharmaceutical approach. But if that's all we're doing and we're thinking that that's going to provide a permanent solution and we're not looking at the mind, what the real true problem is, then we're not really addressing the real true problem. What needs to happen is the mind needs to be trained to let go of craving, desire, attachment, eliminating that mental longing and strong eagerness. That's what's going to eliminate the conditioned feelings, those conditioned pleasant feelings, painful feelings, and neither painful nor pleasant. So in the unenlightened mind, when there's craving, desire, attachment, someone might be tweaking brain chemistry, but those cravings, those longings and yearnings are still in the mind. And if it gets what it wants, it gets pleasant feelings. And if it doesn't get what it wants, it gets painful feelings. Then there's the neither painful nor pleasant feelings that the mind is experiencing. So as long as one is misunderstanding that the brain and the mind are two different things and we're just tweaking brain chemistry, we're not actually getting to a full solution. Even though it's understandable that this discipline of adjusting brain chemistry is needed, particularly in acute situations like psychosis and others, then those things are needed in those situations, but an individual needs to look at the permanent long-term solution, which is training the mind. Let me give you some examples of what I'm referring to here is that we experience as we're maybe being labeled as mental illness. And one is maybe thinking that their brain is defective, but in reality, what it really is, is the mind is just untrained. It's not that there's a defective brain because the experience that the person's having is actually in the mind. So when we label somebody as having a defective brain, now they're not understanding what the real problem is. So if somebody was born into a family and as a child, they experienced certain trauma, Maybe there was verbal abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, and things like that as they were growing up as a child. But now, say they're 25, 35, 40, 50 years old, and they're still very sad being shaken up by these traumatic experiences that have happened in the past. Maybe they're long away from that environment, but their mind is still struggling with sadness or what we might call depression or major depression, these painful feelings. What's happening here is the mind is clinging and holding on to these past experiences as a child. And now, even though that thing has happened in the past, in the present moment with the mind clinging to this experience, it's having painful feelings in the present moment based on something that's happened in the past because the mind just hasn't been trained to let go. When the mind is trained to let go, one can let go of those experiences from our childhood, realizing that that doesn't define who we are as a person. But as long as the mind isn't trained to let go, it will continue to hold on to these past experiences that we refer to as trauma. And now in the current present moment, one can experience sadness or depression or painful feelings because the mind is still clinging. It's still holding on to these past experiences, craving, desiring, wishing that those things didn't happen. But the fact is that they did happen and we can't go back and change it. All we can do is train the mind in the present moment to let that go so that then in the present moment you can experience peace and joy. But as long as the mind is clinging to the past experiences, it won't be able to let go and experience peace and joy in the present moment. There's another one here. Let's talk about bipolar disorder. And we're going to talk about a whole bunch of them here in a moment. But these are just a few to get us started. Bipolar disorder. An individual can be labeled as bipolar and that their brain is defective. And they're taught that their brain isn't producing certain chemicals that it needs. That in this situation, the individual is experiencing this excitement, perhaps, this is often referred to as mania. And then at a period of time, then 
one experiences the crashing or the sadness or the depression. These are pleasant feelings and painful feelings. So sometimes when somebody is experiencing this and they're labeled as bipolar, what's really truly happening is they're having certain cravings, desires, attachments, and they start chasing those in order to get the excitement. So it might be shopping or sex or drugs or some other thing that the mind is chasing, 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 chasing. And now when the mind chases it, if it's getting what it wants, it gets excited, but then it can't permanently get what it wants. So when it stops getting what it wants, maybe a few hours later or a few days or a few months later, the mind will crash and go down into the sadness, the painful feelings, because the cravings aren't being fulfilled. And essentially the mind is untrained here. We're taught that this is a mental illness, the brain is defective, and now you need to take medicine for the rest of your life to tweak this brain chemistry. But the cravings, desires, attachments aren't in the brain, they're in the mind. So as long as we're only tweaking brain chemistry and we're not addressing the real problem in the mind, then the individual is not gonna be able to get to a permanent solution because these chemicals, they're not a permanent solution. So the mind is being conditioned to believe that there is a chemical imbalance in the brain for various mental illnesses and that the problem is this brain chemistry and therefore the solution is a pharmaceutical treatment and sometimes there's recommendation of therapy and things like this so the true source of the problem is still unknown if one is believing that the problem is brain chemistry so therefore people are being led to believe in some cases that their intention speech and actions are a result of brain chemistry so this is wrong view, that the mind doesn't understand what it doesn't understand. And you can even have disciplines in the world where people are going away to colleges and universities, PhD programs, and truly thinking that what they're doing is actually going to solve the problem. But it's not a 100% solution for the problem. So the mind can be conditioned through these experiences of going in and talking to somebody who's in a position of authority and one can believe that their brain is defective and now they're relegated to medications potentially for the rest of their life but never really seeing a permanent solution. So one can escape all of this by understanding right view that the cause of these discontent feelings of anger, sadness, frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, all these others, that they're being caused by craving, desire, attachment. The mind is just untrained. There's a lack of wisdom, moral conduct, and mental discipline. And when we understand what the real problem is, that it's in the mind, and that we can cultivate wisdom to then train the mind, and now through that training, when we eliminate the pollutions, we'll see the real solution occurring because we understand what the real problem is. When there's right view through the three universal truths and four noble truths, then you can actually solve the real problem. But as long as one thinks that the problem is something else, that it's either this brain chemistry or something external, then the individual will continue to struggle because they're not really addressing the true problem. The medication will suppress the emotions, it will suppress the feelings, but it doesn't eliminate the cravings, desires, attachments that are causing it. There's no pharmaceutical that we can introduce that's going to eliminate cravings, desires, attachments. But sometimes what we need is we need this medication to lift the chemistry of the brain up to a certain point, which has an effect to the mind, to get the mind to the point where it can comprehend something like the three universal truths or the four noble truths. Once the mind is, is then capable of learning and practicing and developing its practice, then they can actually get to the real solution. But if one is in psychosis or the brain chemistry is so unbalanced that one can't even take in information to learn, that's where those pharmaceuticals are there to lift up the mind because we're now adjusting the brain chemistry to get the mind to some level of stability. It's not 100% stable, but it's at least able to learn at that point. And that's where then bringing in things like the Eightfold Path and others are going to truly help an individual to then realize a full solution. So now talking about this in more totality and kind of looking at evidence that you can see in the world around us, that is 
if the problem is a defective brain and the human brain is defective, then what we would observe is all populations of people across the world would have the same defects and the same problems across all populations of people. But that's not what we see. We don't see that all of humanity is having the same defective brain. So if the true problem is that the brain is defective, then we would observe all populations of 8 billion people across the world would be having the same defective brain. But humanity in the human mind could not have truly become unbalanced and defective in a matter of a few decades. The way that the modern mental health is approaching this is even though it's been around for you know 150 years or so doing different techniques at one time people were put into what we call the sane asylums or you know straight jackets there were even people that were drilling holes into people's head trying to adjust things in the brain in order to solve these problems but over time it's evolved into pharmaceuticals if the human mind and the human brain has truly become defective, that couldn't have happened in just a few decades. But that's essentially what we're seeing with the modern mental health is that we're being taught that humanity's mind has become defective. And a population of people, their brain can't become defective that quickly. That as humans evolve, we slowly evolve over time and our physical body doesn't change that rapidly. It couldn't have become defective. The brain wouldn't have become defective that quickly. If the modern mental health practices are actually helping, then we would see the number of cases and the number of people with mental illnesses declining. So if we discovered a problem in humanity that yes, the brain is defective, and now we have found the solution, here's the solution, introduce these pharmaceuticals, then what we would see is that the number of mental health cases and situations would be gradually declining because we found the solution. We've discovered the problem and we've now discovered the solution. So now we should see a declining of mental health cases. But that's not what we see. We see a proliferation of more and more and more people that are being diagnosed as mentally ill. So we haven't actually discovered the real problem and the real solution in our modern mental health because we see this proliferation. We don't see a declining. If we saw a declining, that means that we found the real problem, we found the real solution. If the modern mental health practices are helping in solving the real problem, where we see these mental health practices the most, these places would have the most mentally stable and mentally fit populations in the world. So there's places like the USA, or the UK or Australia, where these mental health practices are very popular and a lot of people are using pharmaceutical medications in order to try to tweak brain chemistry to solve things like sadness or other disconsent feelings. If this was the truth and it was actually working, then we would see that those populations of people that were looking to these pharmaceuticals to solve these problems, then these would be the most mentally stable and fit populations in the world because they're using these techniques and they actually are working. But if you look at some of these places that are using these modern mental health practices, I would say that we don't see the most mentally stable and mentally fit populations in the world. That in a lot of these places we see massive amount of mass shootings, we see drug abuse, we see murders and rapes and things like this that are happening in these populations of people. That there's a lot of discontentedness in these populations of people, even though they're relying on the mental health practices of using pharmaceuticals, that the condition of humanity's mind just keeps getting worse and worse and worse. And we see that through the way that society is functioning. So if these mental health practices were actually solving the real problem, we would see that these populations of people are very stable. Here in Thailand, they have these Western medicine practices and they're used very rarely, but people are learning things like the three universal truths and the four noble truths and the eightfold path. Western cultures, they don't understand and practice these teachings, so therefore they're not understanding what the real problem is. They're thinking that the problem is brain chemistry, and they're doing the best that they know how to do by creating some kind of way to address that through brain chemistry and tweaking brain chemistry. 
But if people were growing up as children, learning things like the feelings that you are experiencing is being produced by your own mind, and you need to train your mind to become better and better at managing your feelings and ultimately eliminating these conditioned feelings rather than blaming other people. If we learn these things and we learn the practices of things like the Eightfold Path growing up as children, we wouldn't see the pervasive discontentedness in the communities that we see in the Western world. Here in Thailand, we don't see that. We don't see the massive amounts of mass shootings. We don't see massive murders and rapes and all these other things that we experience in other populations of people because the people are growing up and they have been growing up for 800 to 1200 years learning and practicing these teachings. So while the Buddhist teachings are not 100% being practiced by every single person in Thailand because that would be permanence if it was true, but pervasively these teachings are embedded into the culture so people are growing up in their households and they're learning from mom and dad or aunts and uncles or grandmas and grandpas and brothers and sisters about these teachings and as they're learning about them now they're able to function in the world with peacefulness and joy in a way that we didn't necessarily grow up with if we grew up in a western culture. So you can learn and practice these teachings in order to train the mind to eliminate the discontentedness. A well-trained mind will then be stable. You can create this stability of the mind. You can gradually eliminate medications, enjoying a complete stable mind in a life with peacefulness and calmness and serenity. You can eliminate a lifetime of being relegated to medications and therapies and expenses freeing yourself from this lifetime of expense and side effects through training the mind and liberating it from these strong feelings, getting freedom from the strong feelings and freedom from medications. But when or if you ever choose to do this, it's up to you. It's your choice. And what I would encourage people to do is you will know if you would like to eliminate your medications or not. You'll know when the right time to do that is because you'll notice the stability in the mind. You're not interested in doing a hard cutover from medications to these teachings. Instead, what you would like to do is gradually bring these teachings up in your life, starting to learn them more readily, practice them more readily. And as you go forward, you'll notice over a period of time that the mind's becoming more stable, that there's improvements to the condition of your mind. And if you're seeing doctors and therapists, they will probably notice it as well. Sometimes doctors and therapists find out about me through their patients, that their patients may not even share with them that they're learning and practicing the teachings of the Buddha, but maybe the therapist or the doctor after six months or a year is noticing that their mind is more stable and more steady. And they might ask their patient, you know, what are you doing differently? And they're like, oh, I'm learning the teachings of the Buddha and I'm training my mind. And now the doctor and the therapist are in support to help you gradually reduce your medications because they're seeing your mind becoming more and more stable and more steady. So sometimes a student might ask me, when is the right time to eliminate medications from their practice? I wouldn't answer that question with a direct answer. The answer that I provide people is what you see here, is that it's up to each individual. And what you need to do is you need to build the stability in your mind and notice that stability for your mind yourself. And then as you have the support of the people around you and you can see that your mind is becoming more stable and more steady, you can then gradually reduce your medications. And ultimately you can get to a point where you've completely eliminated the medications 100% if you're noticing those improved significant condition to the mind. This is what I did. At one time, I was diagnosed with major depression, with bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, possibly schizophrenia, muscular sclerosis, and all these other diagnoses. And I was on a lot of different medicines. I couldn't even sleep without taking a handful of medicine. But then slowly but surely, as I trained my mind, I was able to reduce and eliminate the medications 100% getting off of those. And now I haven't had had any of those medications for about five years now. And the mind is more stable and more steady than ever any time in my life. And you can experience the same improvements for yourself. There's multiple different mental health conditions that we might be exposed to in our life. I've got this table in chapter 22 where I'm just introducing you to a couple of these particular conditions that are being described as mental illness. 
But if you have familiarity with the symptoms that one is experiencing, the symptoms are 100% real. The mental anguish that someone is experiencing with these mental health conditions is 100% real. But the cause is not brain chemistry. It's the untrained mind. It's the craving desire attachment. So if you know about the symptoms of any of these conditions, you can then see how there's connections to the teachings of the Buddha and how you can improve the condition of the mind through training the mind. So something like ADHD or ADD, this is where the mind is lacking concentration. The mind is maybe bouncing around from thing to thing to thing. Oftentimes children are diagnosed with this. Maybe at home they grew up watching TV and playing video games. Maybe they're eating and playing on their phone or they're doing other things and their mind's rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. And now when they go to school, it's hard for them to focus because at home for the first five or six years of their life, their mind was rapidly cycling from thing to thing to thing to thing. And as parents, we just might not have the wisdom to understand that we need to help our child to train their mind to have concentration and be able to maintain its calmness and composure. So now when it goes to school, the child is interacting with a teacher and the teacher might ask to send the child to a doctor. And now that doctor observing the lack of concentration might label this person, this child as having ADHD or ADD. But if the parents have wisdom and they're able to help their child, you can actually train the mind of your child. Your child can gradually learn to have focus and concentration where the symptoms of what people are referring to as ADHD can be completely eliminated and one can have concentration. Or if you have or your family or friends have anorexia or bulimia or eating disorders. One might be taught that this is a mental illness, but in reality, there's just a craving in there where the mind is craving to look a certain way that you might see images in a magazine or on TV or superstars. And these images have all been adjusted with computer technology. And now the person's mind has been conditioned to believe that every single person should look a certain way. The mind is craving permanence. It's wanting to look a certain way. There's this false image of beauty and the mind is having this identification with the self or personal identity, thinking that this body is them and that they should look the same way as everybody else. They might have also developed this anorexia, bulimia, or eating disorders by people talking degrading ways to them about their self-image. And now because the mind is craving to look a certain way, one might experience eating disorders. And there's others here as well. This is everything that I'm gonna share with you guys today is this particular chart. And then this second one, which is just a continuation of the chart that's in the chapter 22, because I would just like to provide you guys the opportunity to ask any and all questions that you like around this topic. And we can talk about any specific thing that is described as a mental illness. And I can help you see that through training the mind with the teachings of the Buddha, you can eliminate those symptoms through training the mind. Or if you have family or friends around you that are interested in this, I would be able to help you and help them to understand that they can eliminate these kinds of things. So if you guys would like to ask any and all questions, you're welcome to do that through Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, putting that into the comment section, or you can electronically raise your hand and ask any questions about anything I've shared today or any of these particular mental illnesses, and we can talk about it, and I will help you to be able to see more and more clearly how to eliminate the symptoms that you're experiencing so that you no longer need to consider yourself as having a defective brain, but instead you can see it more and more clearly as just an untrained mind. And with training, you can overcome the symptoms. Looks like we have a question here on Zoom. They're from Max. The first one is, how can we help someone that's had childhood trauma that still affects them? So in order for that person to get help, they're gonna to need to train their mind. They're gonna to need to learn the Eightfold Path. They're gonna to need to learn breathing mindfulness meditation and generosity and all these other aspects of the path. So you would need to be able to perhaps maybe gift them a book or ask them if they're interested in help. And if they're interested, send them a video, send them a link to the group learning program and things like this. Because there's gonna to need to be an interest on their side to get help 
and then they're going to need to reach out to somebody that can actually help them. So if you're still on the path, you don't have the wisdom of how to teach them and how to train them. All you can do is present them options that would allow them to go forward and get help. But ultimately, if you try that two or three times and they're just not interested, then ultimately you need to be able to let go and realize that if this person is interested in suffering and experiencing painful feelings, then that's just what they're choosing to do. And you'll need to let go and not have craving yourself to be able to push them or move them in any certain direction. Here's another question from Max. He says, Teacher David, do you think our current society has become increasingly stressful probably more in America, due to increased cost of necessities and the wages may not match the increase in inflation, etc. Also, social media and technology is quickly degrading society in some way. So the choices and decisions that we make about our life, where we live, the way that we organize our expenses, you know, what type of rent we pay, what type of housing we live in, what kind of clothes we purchase, If our income is less than our expenses, so if our expenses are exceeding our income and we're in a situation where we're going more and more in debt, this is gonna put pressure on one's mind and they're gonna have a lot of challenges. So the cravings, desires, attachments, meaning I want to live in a better house than I can afford or I want a better car than I can afford or I want better clothes or better shoes or better food than what I can afford. Those cravings are very expensive. So if we put ourselves into craving and we just chase after that and our income is lower, then we're upside down and we're going to notice that you're going to be discontent. You have to get to a point where your income is exceeding your expenses. And by throttling back your cravings, you're able to get to that point. There's been different times in my life where I've needed to do that, where I've needed to manage and pull back the cravings so that my income can exceed my expenses. And then when you learn to live like that, as your income increases, you can either be saving money or you can just maintain your lifestyle or just increase it a little bit. But oftentimes in places like America, since you use that as an example, we're taught that it's material objects that's going to produce happiness. So what somebody might do is they might chase after material objects. We might chase a better car, a better house, better clothes. You know, we chase and chase and chase and chase, and we can end up in a situation where we're in debt, pretty significant debt. And there's a situation in places like America where it makes it very easy for you to do that with credit cards and things like this. So if your mind is taught that we should chase after money and wealth and all these different things, then somebody can find themselves in a very challenging situation. And oftentimes what the unalighted mind is doing is it's conforming to the people around you. So if your neighbors and your relatives and friends and coworkers and everybody's coming from the same mentality of chase, 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 materialism, then your mind might have adopted a certain amount of that. So with a large population of people that are just chasing material objects, thinking that this is going to produce long-term satisfaction, and you get people that don't understand right view, and they're all blaming each other for their discontentedness, then you can see a society of people like in America that can be very discontent. And That's not what's experienced here in Thailand. In Thailand, you go to the store, you go to the market, you go out places, people are very polite, very friendly, very peaceful, very joyful, smiling, pleased to see you. And people understand that we need to treat each other well. So there's a large population of people here that have learned to live harmoniously with each other. And if they have any particular feelings, then by and large, most people know that it's not other people that are causing it. So oftentimes in a place that doesn't have these teachings, there's wrong view that is pervasive in society and everybody's blaming each other. There's gossiping, there's slander, there's lying, there's chasing after selfish desires and people just wanting something for themselves rather than practicing generosity with others. So there's all kinds of things like this. What it really boils down to, Max, is it's the ignorance, the unknowing of true reality, which I know you've been part of the Pali Canon and English study group. So you've studied dependent origination, which is the highest ultimate truth of the teaching of the Buddha. And you can see where ignorance or the unknowing of true reality is really what's causing all the difficulties and struggles in one's own mind 
And that's also what's causing the difficulties and struggles in a population of people that are struggling, that there's just an unknowing of true reality. There's this delusion, this confusion, this misunderstanding, this ignorance. And as long as that's there and it's pervasive, people will continue to struggle. So that's why what I can do is from here in Thailand, I can reach out by putting the teachings through the internet and traveling and giving free books and classes and personal guidance to people all over the world so that you guys can then pull the teachings into your life. That's what needs to happen is you can't push the teachings into somebody's life. An individual needs to decide to pull them into their life. And by being here in Thailand, I can then facilitate doing that. So it's the ignorance and unknowing of true reality that allows craving to persist. And as long as craving is there, then there's going to be anger and hostility and bitterness and all those other discontent feelings. All right, you're welcome, Max. Pleased to help you. Let me see if there's any other questions here. Looks like we have a question here on YouTube. But mental diseases are due to chemical deficiency or imbalance. How can this be replenished or balanced? So that's what I'm explaining to you here. I'm not sure if you're a ma'am or you're a sir, but... This is what I'm explaining in this class is that pervasive in the world, we're thinking that it's the brain chemistry that is causing things like sadness or frustration or anger, or hostility or all these other things, anxiety and things like this. But what you come to understand when you deeply penetrate the Four Noble Truths is you can understand that it's not brain chemistry that's causing these discontent feelings, that it sounds like since you're saying what you're saying that you haven't deeply penetrated to understand the Four Noble Truths, to be able to see the truth for yourself that anytime your mind is experiencing discontentedness, it's from the mind. It's from craving, desire, attachment, that mental longing. It's not the brain chemistry. Brain chemistry and the mind are two different things. The brain is the organ. The mind is this intangible, non-physical thing. And when you understand that these are two different things and the real problem is in the mind and you can't eliminate craving, desire, attachment through tweaking brain chemistry, then you can see the truth. So there may need to be a certain amount of chemicals involved if someone's in psychosis or some other acute condition to lift the mind up to get to the point where it can learn and train the mind. But you won't ever get to a permanent solution by applying chemicals to the brain because that's not the real problem. That's not what's causing the discontentedness. And I can tell you this 100% sure because I experienced it in my own life. And I see it with students as well, that when students learn that are taking medications and that have been labeled as mental illness, as their mind becomes more and more stable, they can see that the symptoms are eliminated and they can get to stability of mind through training the mind. But you need to be able to see that for yourself. So there's no amount of tweaking brain chemistry that's going to permanently solve the discontent feelings. Let's see, I see somebody from Cambodia saying, nice to meet you from Cambodia. Welcome, nice to meet you as well. All right, I'm not seeing any questions anywhere. So you guys must be understanding to a certain degree. I know, Eugene, you had your hand up a little bit ago. Do you still have that question or did I answer it as I was talking? Maybe Eugene stepped away. Okay, oh, there you, you go. You, sorry, sorry, uh, uh, you answered it uh, when you were talking. Okay, perfect. So I don't see any other questions anywhere. So what I'll do then is just kind of in class here, thanking all of you guys for joining. And at the same time, encouraging you to read this particular chapter because there's a lot more detail that I put into the chapter like with all these chapters there are certain things that I can share in the book that I don't share in the class and there are certain things in the class that I don't share in the book so a combination of these two of reading and attending the class you'll be able to glean the full benefit of what's being shared with you and then in our next class on Sunday we're going to be in chapter 23 which is titled Symbolism of the Teachings, Reminders Through Imagery. This is where you're going to learn the various symbols that the Buddha used during his life and that are still in place today to remind you of the teachings. So if you see certain artwork at temples or in books or other places, 
there's certain imagery that is used in order to remind people of the teachings. And now that you've learned a significant portion of the teachings in this program, this is an ideal time to teach you that imagery so that you'll understand what these are. So I'm going to be sharing that with you. It's in the book in chapter 23, but I'm also going to be sharing it with you in class so that now when you go around to temples or you look in books or you see artwork that you'll understand the symbolism and you'll be able to glean more insight and it will be able to be nice reminders for you of what the actual teachings are. And then on Wednesday, we're going to be doing breathing mindfulness meditation together. So you guys are welcome to join for either the Sunday class or the Wednesday class. If you can't make them live, of course, they're recorded and you can watch them at any time. And then there's the Pali Canon and English study group on Saturdays that some of you guys might be considering that as you're ending up with the group learning program, you might be thinking about moving into the Pali Canon and English study group, or you might be thinking about repeating the group learning program and learning again, because we're going to be restarting again on the 13th of August from the very beginning. So if you have friends or family that are interested, this might be an ideal time to let them know that we're going to be restarting the program on the 13th of August. So thank you all for your questions. Thank you for your dedication. I appreciate you coming to learn and practice the teachings. As you need help, feel free to reach out, whether it's in classes, whether it's posting questions in the Facebook group, sending me a private message, or scheduling personal guidance. You're always welcome to reach out for help, and I'm here to help you. We'll see you guys in a future class. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. Sawadee Thank you for listening to this podcast. To provide support for this podcast, visit patreon.com forward slash support Buddha. To access more teachings, visit buddhadailywisdom.com. There, you will discover a full range of courses, retreats, and online resources to assist you on the path to enlightenment. Remember to establish a daily, consistent meditation practice, along with learning and practicing these teachings. A well-developed meditation practice is the foundation in which to train the mind to attain enlightenment.